Welcome to the campfire. This is the series where I tell you some scary stories to help you relax. They might be true paranormal experiences, tales from up and coming horror writers, classic ghost stories, creepy pastas, or legends that don't quite fit as a full tape library episode. But I'd also love to include some of your stories in these videos. So if you have a paranormal experience or a scary story that you'd like to share, then you can find my email address in the description, or you can leave it as a comment below. If any of the stories are taken from elsewhere, I have included links to the original work in the description. So if you enjoy a story, make sure you go and give the writer some love. So with that said, get yourself comfortable around the fire. Don't worry about those strange noises in the dark. We're all safe here. Just ask the last group. They're still here, somewhere. Tonight, I have three stories for you. First, we have a close encounter with one of the most infamous serial killers of all time. Then a tale of those monsters that reside in the darkness before finally we hear the terrifying encounters of a nurse who is forced to question her beliefs. So, shall we get started? Imagine how many people must have come into contact with a serial killer over the years and had no idea just how close they came to a horrible fate. Well, that's what happened to this writer back in the 80s. This happened to us back in 1984, just before the whole world knew who the Night Stalker was. I was in elementary school at the time, and lived at home with my parents and siblings in an area in Los Angeles where the Night Stalker was most active. At the time we didn't know it, and no one knew about it, till that summer. Back in those days, my parents and aunt and uncles would all meet at my parents' house for either a Friday night or Saturday night get-together. Most of the times, the parents would all go out and leave us kids at home. They would order pizza, let us make popcorn and drink sodas. A pretty big deal for us kids. The oldest one among us at the time was probably my cousins, who were about 14 and 15. The rest of us were 13 and I was the youngest. One evening, all our parents, aunts and uncles came over, and they did the usual, order us some pizzas, and I remember this as being the first time we had a VCR. We were the first family in our block to get a VCR, so us kids were to stay at home alone, and my cousin rented two movies, I think. It was something like Halloween or Evil Dead, but that was the thing to do was rent scary movies, turn off all the lights in the house, and watch it in the dark. So that night our parents all left us kids at the house. Our old house had a built on extra room, like a den or family room. We had the old popcorn machine that used hot air to make popcorn, and the pizza and sodas were all there. Since there were so many of us, a lot of us younger kids got kicked off the sofa love seat and recliner chairs to be left to sit on the floor. That room had a long sliding glass door that led to the patio outside. As the night went on, our older cousins played tricks on us, typical things to scare us younger kids when we were sitting in the dark watching a scary movie, munching on popcorn. It was getting late, and it wasn't unusual for our parents to return home way past midnight to 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, as sometimes they would go out to eat, then to a place to see live music at this Mexican cantina. As I mentioned, us younger kids were laid out on the floor. We had pillows and were all sprawled out over the den floor. My sister was sitting up against the sliding glass door, that sliding glass door had the typical floor-to-ceiling 80s style curtains. My sister was just behind me, 
I don't remember exactly the details that led up to this. But all of a sudden, she let out the loudest scream. We all jumped up, and of course we thought she did that to scare us all. But she was shaking and in tears. My female cousin jumped up and went over to her, and got out of her that there was a man outside the sliding glass door, trying to get in. He must have thought that no one was in the house because it was all dark and all the cars were gone. Everyone immediately jumped up and I remember we went around turning all the lights on in the house. My older brother said let's run across the street. Our neighbour was a sheriff deputy. We all ran from our house to his house. I remember crossing our neighbourhood street like if someone was after us. We banged on the door saying we need help. His wife answered the door and let us in, and then he came out from his bedroom. I remember he grabbed his revolver, and that thing looked huge, like Dirty Harry. He also grabbed his big flashlight and told his wife to call the station. We stayed with her while he went to our house, and by that time a couple of cop cars pulled up. Sure enough, there was evidence that someone had jumped our brick wall fence and there were tool marks on the sliding glass door. They asked my sister to describe the man, and she said, dark guy, tall, curly hair, skinny, and dressed all in black. By this time, our parents started to arrive at home to all the commotion The police kind of played it off as an attempted break-in and recommended keeping lights on like porch light and a few lights inside. They said it was probably some random bum looking for some quick cash for drugs. Fast forward to that summer and the summer from hell when Los Angeles was in a heat wave and it was the summer of the Night Stalker. He ended up killing a neighbour of my mum's friend from church. To this day, I wonder if it was the Night Stalker who tried to break into our house. Please turn off the lights. The odd request from my seven-year-old made me halt on the doorway. She had always asked to sleep with the lights on since she was four, so hearing that baffled me. Stories about monsters would leave her frantic, as she begged me to leave the lights on back then, so I was truly taken aback. Do you want me to leave the door ajar at least? I asked in return, still in confusion as I waited for her response. I added that I would leave the hallway lit, so she could have a sliver of light, but she insisted on being in the dark. Whatever questions I had, I decided to bury them for the meantime, and resorted to bidding her a good night before I closed the door shut. Every night after telling her that I loved her, she'd always remind me to flick the switch down. I'd give her one last smile before losing her completely in the atmosphere of ebony. What started out as a want for darkness during her bedtimes had crawled even on our moments on the couch together. Please turn the lights off. I'd look at her with a raised brow as she bent her head down while the television blared in the background. Even after submitting to her request, I still noticed how she never truly watched the program as her eyes remained on the corner where no light shone. I left it alone at first as she was never a problem child, but when she asked to dine in the dark, that's when I had to draw the line. You know I can't do that. My concern must have won over my sternness as her teary eyes met mine at the dining table. I expected her to protest, 
but all I got were sniffles as she ate her meal, with her eyes no longer seeing mine. Sleep abandoned me that very night, so I decided to check in on her, and found her still very much awake. I dismissed whatever apology she was about to say and relayed my own. I am truly sorry for reacting like that. Can I please know why you've been acting this way? Even in the blackness of the room, I can still see the illumination of her tears, and it broke my heart even more. Remember those monsters? The reason why I always wanted to sleep with the light on? I hummed a simple yes, and what she confessed next turned my concern into dread. Because all this time, I thought she was just being brave. They are much scarier in the light, and I couldn't take it anymore. I've been a nurse for about six years, with the last two years being spent in an ICU at my local hospital. I am a 28 year old woman who is barely five feet tall and weighing close to 110 pounds. Even with my small stature, I have never been the type of person to fear the unknown. I have always been a strong believer in science and that there is a logical explanation for most odd events. Though raised Catholic, I truly don't believe in any religion. More agnostic than atheist, but that's not the point. Basically, I am saying I do not believe in the supernatural or spooky monsters. That is until the last five months. I cannot explain what is going on with me. I am either experiencing a mental breakdown or there is something unnatural in this world that I never thought was possible. Let me start from the beginning. I had just clocked in at 7.01am on my 18 bed unit. It was my last work day of the week, but also my on call meaning I had to stay an extra four hours after my regular 12 hour shift. We were surprisingly not full and less than half the beds were occupied with patients. This was not long after that most recent wave of COVID when we were so packed that we had to open up another ICU to hold our vented critical patients and constantly had overflow waiting in the ER. So coming into work with only eight patients and five nurses on schedule felt too good to be true. I was only assigned one patient at the time, but was open for the first admission. My morning went by pretty slow and uneventful as I cared for my one patient and helped out co-workers with the basics. Around 11am, my charge informed me I was getting the new ER admission. Great. I took the name and medical record number from her, and began looking them up on my computer. Gary Nelson, 31 year old male. Main diagnosis, ETOH withdrawal. Ugh, I hate alcohol withdrawal patients. I thought as I continued to read the chart. His vitals looked stable and I could see that they started him on a pre dick strip in the ER, which is why he has to come to the ICU. I go to the notes and find the admitting physician's note. What I read surprised me a little. 31 year old male with no significant past medical history presenting in ED for hallucinations and seizures, most likely due to the ETOH withdrawal. 
patient is a poor historian, refusing to answer many questions. Upon examination, appears malnourished, but all systems intact, accompanied by two officers of SPD, currently in police custody. I read the remainder of the notes, which just reviewed all labs and medication had been given. I couldn't find anything else on why this man was in police custody. I guess it was not pertinent to delivering medical care. But in my six years as a nurse, I have never actually dealt with this situation. It's a decent sized suburb I live in, but my hospital isn't the biggest in the area, or even the closest to the police station, so it was odd that we would get someone in custody. I was curious about what the person had done, but honestly was expecting a DUI or some type of petty crime. I jot down some information on the patient and just continue going about my day, waiting for him to come up to the unit. Around 11.45, I see Erica pushing a stretcher down our hall. Now, Erica is a veteran ER nurse, like 20 plus years working in level 1 trauma hospitals and very underfunded hospitals in the bad parts of the city before coming to this hospital, meaning she has seen some shit and knows how to handle herself with crazy and dangerous patients. So when I see her face looking a little paler and walking faster than usual, I can feel little buds of anxiety starting to blossom in my head. On either side of Erica are two rather large policemen with stern faces, eyes surveying the unit. I look onto the stretcher, expecting some big guy covered in tattoos and wearing leather or something. I guess the stereotypical criminal pops into mind. What I see instead is this average looking man. Well, almost average. He looks very dishevelled. His brown short hair was sticking up at random angles, almost appearing matted on the side. His eyes look sunken in his head, with large dark puffy bags underneath. He was staring down at his lap. Or maybe it was at his hands, which were both restrained to the side rails. Now these weren't the usual restraints we use. They were violent restraints that were rarely used except for patients who were a threat to themselves and the staff. He did indeed look rather malnourished, with the regular sized gown drowning on his thin frame. When they arrived to his room, the police undid the restraints from the rails and put handcuffs on his wrists in front of his body. As we slid him onto the ICU bed, the officers were standing there like they were ready for him to jump up and attack. Luckily, he did nothing, just lay down and kept staring towards his feet. They then took off the handcuffs and put the restraints back onto his new bed. One officer stayed in the room and one stood outside the door. When Erica and I walked out the door so she could give me a report on this patient, the officer outside spoke to me. Do not go into this room unless you see me or my partner in there. One of us will always be in the room. Got it? I was in some state of shock, thinking how bad could this guy be? I just nodded at the officer and walked to the counter. As soon as I saw Erica, I just started asking questions. Dude, what the hell? Who is this guy? Did he kill someone? Is he actually dangerous? Like, am I going to get hurt? I was whispering to her, with my back to the room and the officer. I don't know. He has barely talked, and when he does, it's just creepy. I can't really explain it. He just gives me such a bad vibe. I overheard Giant 1 and Giant 2 over there talking when they first brought him in. Have you read about those recent murders in the area? Erica took a deep breath as she handed me this paper chart. Uh, sorta? I think I heard about some girl found near the river a month or so ago. Honestly, I don't watch the news often. Was that him? 
I was trying to rack my brain on any details I remember my fiance telling me a while ago about the case. I only remembered that she was young. In high school, I think. She was found after being missing for three days, under the bridge near the river. Apparently, they think he's the one that killed her, and four others. That's not even the worst part. He was found with his last two victims a few nights ago. They were his wife and four-year-old son. She eyed the room and police officer as we kept whispering back and forth. The officer gave her a strange look and she stood up a little taller. Okay, well let me give you the report on this guy. She didn't go much more into what she had overheard, but she just stated the facts that she knew. He was arrested two days ago, apparently very drunk. He was being kept in holding when earlier this morning he began having vivid, visual and auditory hallucinations and experiencing seizures according to the officers who brought him in. She told me all the information I needed to know to provide him with care. She ended the report with one last look back at the door and almost more to herself than me, she said, just be careful okay. I've dealt with criminals before, but something is off with this guy. I don't know what, but just have a bad feeling. Always know where the door is, and never let him be between you and the door. If you feel like something is going to happen, just leave. She looks back at me and forces a laugh. Sorry, I'm probably being overdramatic. You'll be okay. She grabbed her stretcher and monitor, and left the unit quickly. My charge nurse, a couple of co-workers and myself go into his room and start doing what we do to every ICU emission. We are wiping his body with CHG wipes, changing the gown and putting our monitoring devices on him. It was a little complicated since the officers would not let us remove the restraints in order to turn him fully, but we did what we could. During this cleaning we noticed he was not only covered in dirt, but also what appeared to be blood. He had small splatters everywhere on him. His arms, chest, back. His hair was in fact matted on one side with blood. The officers gave us permission to wipe him down as they had already collected enough evidence and photos. When we were all done, we were surprised not to find any cuts or abrasions on him, thus proving further that this was not his own blood in my mind. Throughout this whole process, Gary did not say a single word. He would follow our commands when asking him to turn or move his body, but never said anything to the questions we were asking. When we were done, my co-workers all left the room. Only Gary, the officer, and myself were left. The anxiety I'd felt earlier was so much worse now. I had to actively remember to breathe and make myself stop shaking. I should also mention, I can be pretty awkward in uncomfortable situations. My mind often goes blank in these situations, so I end up usually saying the first thing that comes to mind, which is almost always something awkward. And this, my friends, was a very uncomfortable situation. So, Gary, as I said before, my name is Gwen. I'm going to be your nurse today. Since you just came into the hospital, I have to go through some boring admission questions with you. No response. I look to the officer, then back to Gary. Well, at least you're not in jail right now. I mean, like you're arrested, but not physically in jail. You're in a hospital. And, um, it's nicer, I guess. Like, at least there's no metal bars on the door. I still have the scary cop watching you, though. So, yeah. I was wincing at everything I said as I stared at the computer. I glanced quickly behind me at the officer who was just staring at me like I was crazy. Then I peeked at Gary, who surprisingly had a faint smile on his face. The beds are comfier here than in jail, Gary whispered. Oh, cool. Anyways, can I ask you some questions? I quickly changed the subject. My awkwardness somehow warmed him up to talking to me. A little bit of my anxiety ebbed the more we talked. He answered almost all of my questions regarding his health history and any medications he had been taken. On paper this was a healthy, normal 31 year old. No mental health issues, 
physical issues. He had a stable job and a good family life prior to four months ago. When I asked what happened four months ago, that changed everything. He became quiet again. I figured he was not going to tell me, and I began to get ready to leave the room. Then, he started talking. According to him, everything changed when he witnessed a stranger kill himself. He said he was riding the train back home after working late one night. There were not many people in the car, and he was one of the last stops. When there was just one more stop to go, only him and a young guy were left on the train. They were sitting across the aisle from each other. Gary hadn't paid him much attention until then, when he started noticing the guy was staring at him. He asked the guy what he wanted, and the guy said to just be able to sleep for once. Gary said this guy looked sickly, wearing baggy clothes, and sunken eyes and greasy hair and skin, so thin it looked translucent. He initially was just going to ignore the man, but then the man got up and sat directly in front of him. Gary said he felt nervous and wanted to leave, but he couldn't for some reason. The man just sat quietly, staring at Gary. As the train began to slow, coming up to Gary's stop, the man pulled out a gun. Gary was frozen and still couldn't move. The man said, I'm sorry, but I can't live like this anymore. Please forgive me. I need sleep. Then shot himself in the head, splattering Gary with the bloody aftermath. As Gary was telling me this story, he had a grief-stricken look in his eyes. Tears slowly running down his face, I looked at the officer, who was scribbling rapidly into his notebook. When I left the room, I was actually feeling bad for Gary. The anxiety I had earlier was almost gone. He seemed rather nice, and to have something so horrible happen in front of him. No one deserves to see that. I had almost forgotten what Erica had said about him murdering his family. Allegedly, that is. I continued on with my day, doing my hourly checks on my patients. Every time I went into Gary's room, he would engage in conversation with me. He was always friendly, and actually was a pretty good patient. Since he was there for alcohol withdrawal, I had to keep assessing his CIWA score to see if he needed medications to prevent withdrawal symptoms. He kept scoring high, stating he kept seeing people who were not there and hearing them talk and touch him. His hands were visibly shaking every time I went in the room, yet he seemed cheered up whenever I would enter. He said, when I came in, the people would leave until I left. I had given him multiple higher doses of Ativan throughout my shift, but it did not seem to be working. He was already maxed out on a sedation drip, so we just kept giving him more and more medications. A normal person would probably be knocked out from the amount of benzos we were pushing, but not Gary. He looked absolutely exhausted, but he would not close his eyes long enough to sleep. When I mentioned it, he just stared at me and said, I cannot sleep. If I sleep, then I will not be me. I can't let that happen. I knew if we kept giving him the meds, he would not be able to resist sleeping. The drug would take over and nothing he could do would stop it. Around 6pm, I walk into his room and I see he is sleeping. I feel almost happy for him that he is finally resting. I go into the room to change out my IV bag that's almost empty. I'm being extra careful not to make a lot of noise because I don't want him to wake up. The IV pole is on the other side of the bed, meaning I have to walk past him and the bed to get to it. At this time, 
The officers were also at shift change. So as I'm switching out my old bag for the new bag, the two new officers were huddled together with the two that had been there all day in front of the door. They were not technically out of the room, but they did not have a clear view of me or Gary the way they were standing. I did not notice this at first, since I was focused on my medication. I turned my head slightly to look at the sleeping patient, but what I saw made me freeze. Gary was almost crouching in the bed, with both hands on the railing closest to me, leaning towards me. His face had a wide, almost unnatural grin, like he was clenching his jaw so hard it was about to break and the skin was being forced to widen as far as possible. His eyes were wide, pupils dilated so much you could barely see any colour of his iris, making them look like black holes, sucking you into their depth. It felt like the room was on fire. I could feel sweat dripping off my back and down my legs, yet I felt cold inside. Like something was trying to steal something precious that was deep in me. My head felt heavy and felt like the room was spinning as Gary got closer and closer to me. I couldn't make a noise or move an inch. Time seemed to be moving so slow. All I could think was, how did he get out of his restraints? Where is the cop? I'm going to die. Suddenly... I heard footsteps approaching. My eyes shifted from this horror in front of me to the door. The cop stopped right when he saw me, then looked to the bed, then continued towards the chair that was occupied by the previous cop. I wanted to scream at him to do something, but when I looked at the bed, I saw Gary laying down, sleeping as he had been when I first entered, in his restraints as if nothing had happened. I practically ran out the room, straight to the bathroom and started sobbing. What just happened? I had to have imagined that. There is no way he could have got out of those restraints. And if he did, he would not have been able to get back into them in a blink of an eye. I convinced myself it was all in my head and I was just tired having worked the past two days. I wanted to avoid his room, but I knew as his nurse I was responsible for providing care. I was just going to be more cautious when I entered again. I did not tell anyone about what I thought I saw, because I had to believe it wasn't real. The next time I entered, Gary was awake. He looked at me as if nothing happened, but I could sense something was off. I was asking him the usual questions about having hallucinations, being anxious, headaches, etc. When I looked down and saw his right hand was out of the restraint, I slowly started back in towards the door and was about to yell at the officer when Gary looked me in the eyes. His eyes were more normal, but looked deeply sad like he was watching something horrid unfolding in front of him. I'm not sure if he was really looking at me or something else. Tears were running down his face. He whispered something I couldn't hear. It felt like something was pulling me closer to him. I was now an arm lengths away from him. I saw something shiny, like still in his unrestrained hand. He looked down and then back in my eyes and said, I'm so sorry. I never meant to do it. Please forgive me. I need sleep. Quicker than I thought possible, he raised his hand and ran it across his throat. I was splashed with red hot sticky blood. In his hand lay a scalpel. As if this was all in slow motion up until he slit his throat, everything after was sped up. I remember screaming and trying to apply pressure to his neck as the police officer grabbed me and took me out of the room. 
I remember sitting in room after room, being asked the same questions over and over again. How did he get the scalpel? How did he get out of his restraint? What did he tell you? What did you do? I did not have any of the answers. Fast forward to now, five months after Gary's death. I keep waking up in strange areas that I don't remember going to sleep in. I've had people say that they have seen me at night, but I ignore them when they try to get my attention. I feel like I haven't slept since that day at the hospital, even though I know I fall asleep every night. And today, I find myself covered in blood, but I have no wounds on me anywhere. This isn't my blood. I don't know who I am when I fall asleep. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's campfire stories. And don't forget, if you have a story to share, then please do get in touch. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I've got plenty more scary stories coming. So hopefully we can spend many, many sleepless nights together in the future. Maybe just for tonight, leave the lights on. It doesn't keep the monsters away anyway.